Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of June 26th, 2023. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss the argument that's missing from the PFD discussions, even by its defenders. Second, we discuss some recent insight into what budget issues are likely coming in the next session. And third, we discuss a recent development in the oil fields that could be a very big thing in terms of production levels. And now, let's join Michael. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, the weekly top three. Uh, Brad comes in, uh, he hits us with three big topics that uh, he thinks are important, and uh, we discuss them today. We're going to uh, we're going to talk uh, a little bit uh, about what's coming up on the session, the next big thing, and we're going to start off with number one, which is the one thing that everybody apparently seems to be missing from discussions of the PFD, including the PFD defenders. Now we had uh, we had Ben Carpenter on the program yesterday for a full hour. He saved my bacon because I could hardly talk, but. He really went into a lot of his thoughts, and he distilled a lot of the thoughts that he had in his letter to the editor, which you reference uh, today um, in your in your number one of the weekly top three. So hit us with it, Brad. What is the one thing that when we're talking about um, uh, when we're talking about the PFD that everybody seems to be missing, as you're saying here? Well, Michael, there's one fact that that you know we've known about since 2016, 2017 that. I've talked about a lot, uh, but does has, has not penetrated the public conversation. And that is that PFD cuts take more from 80% of Alaska families than would taxes. Taxes would be better, would take less from 80% of Alaska families than, uh, than do PFD cuts. And, and, and we, and, and that to me, to me at least, but, but that is a compelling argument. We want to make Alaska families' lives better. We want to make the Alaska economy better. We've gotten to a situation where no one, I don't think, any longer believes that we're going to cut our way out, do spending cuts to cut our way out of this situation. We are stuck in a mode where we're going to have this continual spending going forward. And to pay for that spending, uh, PFD cuts take more. If we pay for that spending through PFD cuts, that takes more from 80% of Alaska families uh, than using an alternative means of an alternative uh, tax. Ben, um, Ben's piece in the ADM, about 600 words, 650 words, doesn't mention the word tax once. It is, it is sort of the, the, the typical, uh, the typical, we're going to find government efficiencies. We're going to find ways to cut spending. We're going to find ways to do this better. We're going to have management plans that do this better. And we're going to, and we're going to manage our way out of, out of this situation that way. We're not, we saw that in 2019 uh, when the governor tried to do exactly that and the pushback that he got, he, that, that he got as a result of right. that. It's, it's not changed at all. The spending keeps going up. Ben talked yesterday about operating spending going up. Eleven uh, percent since he's been in office, right? It's it, that's not changing, and right. so the and so the 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 focus to me should be on how we're going to pay for it. 
and right. and eighty and 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 it, paying for it the way we've been paying for it through PFD cuts hits eighty percent of Alaska families. I it's not it's not just Ben. I mean, the Democrats don't even talk about this. I would yeah. think. In I fairness, would, in fairness, Ben did talk about it yesterday while he was on the program. He did talk about taxation. As a, because he said it has to have that connection between the public and private. And, and you know, we he gave all the reasons. He did talk about it yesterday. I don't know if maybe in 600 or 700 word limit, he didn't have enough time to get into it, but whatever. He did mention it yesterday. So, but it's it's few and far between the discussions on it for sure. And he, and he didn't, and he didn't mention the 80% number. I mean, what, what he talked about was yeah. we have to have a connection between the economy and and state government and taxes are a way of constructing a, a are the way of constructing a connection between. But he didn't talk about the fact that eighty percent of Alaska families would be better off uh, with uh, uh, with uh, uh, using taxes instead of PFD cuts. I this is an issue. I mean, if if I were a Republican looking to challenge Donna Mears in East Anchorage, or if I were a Republican. Uh, looking to challenge Andy Josephson, or I was a Republican looking to challenge Andrew Gray. This is an issue that I would hit all day long. Look, these guys voted with the Senate to use PFD cuts to fund government. They didn't even try to push uh, an alternative that has a lower adverse impact on 80% of, on 80 of Alaska families. They didn't even try an alternative that would have been better for the constituents in Donna Mears district or in, or in Andrew Gray's district or in and, and Andy Josephson's district. They didn't even try. They, they, they log, logged on to the, the Senate's version of using PFD cuts and, and, and ran with that. And they're, they're not looking out. I mean, I would say in, in, if I were using this issue, they're not looking out for Alaska families. They're looking out for government employees because they want to fund government employees, um, and they're looking out for the top twenty percent. The, the other, the other fact that I think is is should be pressed would be is 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 understandable and and could be pressed is PFD cuts aren't necessary to fund increased spending. What PFD cuts are doing is making sure that the top twenty percent don't have to pay for spending. They're taking money out of the pockets of, of the other 80% of Alaska families, paying for spending that way so the top 20% don't have to reach into their pockets and pay a proportionate share of the cost of government. It's a, it's a cross-subsidy between the, an upward cross-subsidy between the other 80% and the top 20%. So it's a and wealth. It's a wealth transfer is what you're saying. It is. It's from absolutely the, a wealth transfer. From the lower 80% to the upper 20%. It's 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 allowing the top twenty percent to avoid contributing significant amounts uh, of material amounts uh, in, uh, to the cost of government in the same way that the eighty percent are being required to uh, through PFD cuts, and and that's a I mean some people say that's a populist approach. No, it's not. I mean because what we know is also that PFD cuts have the largest adverse impact on the overall economy. And how do we know? And 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 why is that? Because we're taking more money out of the pockets of of eighty percent of Alaska families, those who spend into the Alaska economy. We're taking more money out of their pockets than we than we would be uh, through other means. So it's, I mean, I, I read Ben's I read Ben's piece in the ADN, and I was excited uh, for the headline. I was excited at the beginning, and it starts off great. Uh, but then when you get to the solutions, it just sort of, you know, it's another one of these, well, we're going to cut our way out or we're going to manage our way out, or we're going to have these management approaches to, to get our way out of it. Ben deserves a lot of credit for stepping up and, and introducing a sales tax as, as a means as, as an alternate means of, of, of paying for government as a means that spreads the burden brought more broadly among all Alaska families that reaches the top 20% and reaches non-residents, which we don't do now. He deserves a lot of credit for that. But, but then he just sort of, it, it's like he doesn't, it, it's like he doesn't really believe in it in a way, because when you get to the op-ed and the ADN that a lot of people are going to read, um, it's just, it just sort of disappears. It, it isn't in there. So I, I, I don't get it. 
it, it is an issue that is explainable. It's an issue that's understandable. It's an issue that 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 aligns Republicans, aligns those who articulate the issue in that way, aligns them with 80 percent of Alaska families, aligns them with uh, the overall Alaska economy uh, and, and shows a way forward that if we're going to continue to spend, balances the spending, balances the responsibility for the spending, includes non-residents, reduces the burden on Alaskans by 7 to 10 percent by getting a portion of the revenues from uh, getting a portion of the revenues from non-residents. It is it is a clear cut issue uh, that I think uh, is a is a is the defense uh, of the PFD. Yet the defenders don't do it. Uh, the, the defenders won't don't use the issue, don't use the, the approach. Um, and even, as I say, even the Democrats don't use the approach. So I, I, we're doing it to ourselves in a way. Well, I mean, and in part, this is part of the whole Republican campaign from a certain group and breed of Republicans over the last few years that basically have all said, um, you know, don't give us a tax and then give us the PFD uh, because you'll just be taxing us for our PFD. Instead, just take the PFD. That's what they've been. That's kind of the argument that in a nutshell, that's been coming out of a certain group of Republicans, not shrink the size and scope of government, not be more efficient, not be not all the cutting aspects and cutting language that we use here on the program. But instead, they said, well, if you want your PFD, it'll be small because otherwise we have to tax and blah, blah, blah. But again, the there's no acknowledgement of the uh, economic impact of just taking the PFD. It is a tax, by the way. I mean, that's what nobody seems to acknowledge. Well, if you just tax us and then the PFD, well, it is a tax. They're taking the money out and away from Alaska. It doesn't go into the economy and it doesn't do it. So we are being taxed whether we like it or not. That's the thing. Yeah, exactly right. And and those those who are saying that don't tax me to, to, to pay a PFD, that's the top 20%. I mean, what they're really saying is don't tax me to pay for government, take money from the other 80% by cutting, by cutting their PFD. The PFD isn't, the PFD isn't being paid for by taxes. We all know where the PFD comes from. It comes from permanent fund earnings. That's set by statute. It's not being, it's not, it wouldn't be paid for by taxes. What taxes would do is, is have the top 20% non and non-residents pay a proportionate share of the cost of government and reduce the burden that we've shifted to the, the other 80% by, by taking money out of well, their pockets. Or and that's also taxes. dependent on the type of tax too, right? I mean, it all depends on whether it's a sales tax or a flat tax. Or, it, it, the, yeah. the, um, the, the extent to which it comes out of the pockets of the top 20% and non-residents is, is dependent on the tax. But every tax, every tax is better takes less from the other 80 percent than uh, than PFD cuts by by wide margins. I mean, that's that's one of the things that got me about the Democrats. When Ben proposed a sales tax, they said, oh, it's regressive. Horrible. Well, you want regressive. Look at PFD cuts. <laughs> I mean, that was my first thought when we saw some of those car. In fact, I think I said that. Notice how they're not talking about the regressivity or the impact of the PFD cuts on the uh, on the economy in Alaska. So I, I mean, I, yeah, I talk about it till I'm blue in the face. Others sometimes talk about it, but, but the press isn't going to pay attention. And, and, and as a result of that, Alaskans aren't going to pay attention until our elected officials, the politicians say that, say that 80% are going to be better off uh, with taxes as opposed to PFD cuts or put another way, PFD cuts are worse for 80% of Alaska families than, uh, than taxes. Until the politicians say that, it's not going to be picked up in, in the press. Uh, and until the press picks it up, it's not going to be uh, it's not going to be widely known or 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 cared about or considered uh, by other Alaskans. That's that issue is the issue that wins the that wins it. And we're just giving up on it. OK, Donna says, please stop making Randy sound correct with the Robin Hood argument, which is the rob from the rich to steal for a rob from you know what I mean? kind of the splitting. I don't know what the other solution is, though. Uh, I mean, even Ben is talking about taxation, um, and although he's not bringing in the 80 percent argument. Um, it I mean, it's a pretty valid argument that they're trying to insulate themselves from any from any, you know, any real way of having to pay. I mean, if they if they get a sales tax, I mean, that's very limited. That's a limiting factor in and of itself. 
because it'll have some kind of overhead limit and it'll it'll have a max out at you know whatever a thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars or whatever it is um and so i don't know how you don't make that argument in that regard when you look at it from an analytical honest standpoint i don't know how you look at it and go they are protecting themselves it is a way that they're protecting themselves in that kind of robin hood-esque way oh it's 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 not a right and we may have just seen the explanation of why ben doesn't talk about it but the reverse way. robin hood i guess is what i would say if if that's if that's what donna's saying but it it's um yeah. It's not a Robin Hood argument. What what the we're not we're not taking from the rich. This argument isn't taking from the rich to give to the poor. This argument is having the rich pay their proportionate share of the costs of government. Whatever the costs of government are, high, low, in between. It's having the top 20% pay their proportionate share of the and non-residents pay their proportionate share of the cost of government. What we've got now is we're taking from the poor to give to the rich, essentially. We're making the we're making the other eighty percent of Alaska families pay more, so that the top twenty percent and can can pay a lot less, and non residents pay zero. What we're basically doing is using the 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 money from the other eighty percent to indemnify, to protect, to 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 cover, to 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 shield the top 20% in non-residents from paying for the proportionate share of costs of government. That's exactly what's going on. And, and if it's a Robin hood, it's, 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 as you said, it's the reverse Robin hood It's taking from the poor to cover the rich, to pay for the pay for the costs that otherwise should be paid for paid for the top 20%. If, I mean, if, if some people think, if some people think this is taking from the rich to give to the poor, Show me where that happens, because it doesn't. It takes from the it takes from the poor the 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 PFD cut now takes from the poor takes from well takes from middle and and takes from eighty percent of Alaska families more from eighty percent of Alaska families than it does from the top twenty percent, and it doesn't take anything uh, from the from the uh, from the from the non residents. All the taxes would do is in some way increase the, the proportionate share of the cost of government being paid by the, the top 20% non-residents and reduce the excess being paid currently, being taken currently from the pockets of, of the other 80%. And, and I guess I would say at least one silver lining of that whole situation is at least the tax would be in the open. I mean, that, I mean, I'm not a fan of taxes and I don't want to pay taxes, but we are paying taxes right now. They're just stealth taxes in the form of the PFD cut. At least in that case, the tax would be out in the public on the table, visible for everybody to see. And, uh, and not that I would think that, you know, you and I have had this disagreement before. You could institute a tax and then government would just gobble up all the money anyway. So but I mean, again, at least there would be at least it would be up and above board at that point. Right. I well, mean, and one other thing, Michael, it would it would involve the top twenty percent. They would then be or having to see in their own pockets engaged, yeah, the the cost of government, and and they're the ones that control uh, the lobbyists. They control the 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 people that are, go down to Juno. They are the donor class. If they were engaged, there would be a lot more pushback. If if Natasha von Imhoff had to pay four percent of her net income to, uh, or Kathy Giesel, or Bert Stedman, or Click Bishop, or Gary Stevens, had to pay 4% of, of their income to cover the cost of government, there would be less government. Right now, Natasha von Imhoff is paying 0.2%, well, less than 0.2%, because she's in the top, top 1%. Gary Stevens, Click Bishop, Bert Stedman, all paying significantly less than than half that half the four percent in terms of the, in terms of the impact of PFD cuts on them, if right. they had to pay the same thing that everybody else is paying, good lord, we wouldn't have any government. If they had to pay at least the proportionate amount, a proportionate amount of the cost of government, in same proportion that everybody else have is having to bear through PFD cuts, there would be less government. But that's not what we're doing. Right. Uh, that's number one, Brad. Give me a quick tease for number two. Number two is uh, there was a, a, a 
get together of, of constituents and uh, local elected officials in Juneau uh, where they discussed issues coming up for the next year. And I think it's probably the next year's agenda for the legislature uh, uh, that will be considered. So we're going to talk a little bit about what that is. It's what I call SSDD. That's what it's all about. Okay. Uh, weekly top three continues. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We're on to number two, which is maybe a snapshot uh, or a sneak peek of what we're going to be looking at in the next session, uh, Brad is referencing an article in the um, Juno Empire uh, where they're talking about local legislators putting together this year's achievements and looking for next year's goals. And, uh, well, it was it, it's interesting. I guess SSDD is what I keep saying, but that seems to be the theme. Brad? SSDD is same story, different day. Same stuff, different day. Yeah, that's the uh, uh, that's the politically correct version. Same stuff, different day. I, I, I thought we were I thought we were off in some psychological. No, no, it's the same categorization stuff. there. <laughs> it's it's Groundhog Day, Brad. It's Groundhog Day. That's right. what it is. Well, uh, so the Juno delegation, Andy Story, Sarah Hannon, and Jesse Keel had a had a, uh, a, a meeting, constituent meeting, to wrap up the legislative session and to talk about the way forward. And it's important for a couple of things. One, because I think it's an indicator of where the Senate's going to be. Jesse's a member of the majority. It, it reflects, I mean, his opinions have reflected what the, the, what the opinions of the Senate majority have been. Sarah and, uh, and Andy are members of the House minority, but this last session we found out the House minority can combine with enough people in the House majority, a, fla a fractured House majority, to get through what the Senate wants. So the, the House minority sort of played the, the, the balance of power by, by joining with the Senate and then, and then uh, uh, peeling off enough, enough Republicans from the House majority to, uh, to, to pass the bill. So what they're saying, what these representatives and, and, and Jesse are saying, I think is a, is a good indicator of where A, the Senate's going to go, B, where the Senate minority is going to go. And and, and see as a result of that where the budget's going to go. And here's what she said. Story said she believes the more hopeful outlook is for a long-term increase to education funding next year, meaning next session, and hopefully this governor's help veto will help spur even more advocates. She also expressed similar optimism about boosting public employees' pensions, one of the top goals this session of the bipartisan Senate majority and Democrat-led minority, and through a bill that advanced the Senate committee, Senate Finance Committee that Keel's a member of. When we start the second half of legislative session, that is going to be up front and center. Healthcare was another issue raised by multiple residents that Story responded, Story and Keel responded uh, favorably to. So what we what's going to be on the agenda is same stories, same story, different day. Uh, is going to be just additional spending. It's not, we're not going in reverse. We're not going to have reduced spending. House majority is fractured enough that, that we're not going to have a budget that reflects uh, the, the priorities of that Ben outlined in, the, uh, in his ADN column. We're going to have a, a, a bill that outlines, we're going to have a budget that outlines uh, the spending priorities of the Senate majority and, uh, and the House minority uh, using a fractured House majority to, to get the votes, necessary votes to get it passed. So how are we going to pay for it? And, and that, that I think, you know, leads us right back to, to the question that we discussed in the first segment. But it's a question that's not addressed at all in, in the discussion that, that, that the Juno reps had with their constituents, or in fact, you know, the, the, the similar discussions that are going on, uh, going on in Anchorage uh, and elsewhere. It's just assumed, well, we'll just keep using PFD cuts uh, to, uh, to, to continue to, uh, to continue to fund uh, the increased spending, continue to do it on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families. So it's, uh, it, it is the same story second day. It is, it is, if they can come up with more spending, um, you know, what, what that doesn't mention, it mentions increased K through 12. It doesn't mention the universities, uh, uh, the governor's vetoes, vetoed a significant amount of capital spending to the universities. I'm sure there will be an effort to restore that and a, and a push forward on that. Um, doesn't mention defined benefits. Uh, uh, 
uh, beyond teachers, but I'm sure there's going to continue to be the, the, the effort to expand the role of define or expand the availability to define benefits beyond the public safety officers where it started and beyond the teachers now to include all state employees. So we're, we're, we're headed into an environment where spending keeps going up and up and up and up. And, you know, and the question really that we, that, that, that confronts us is how we're going to pay for it. And if we don't talk about alternative revenue measures that are, that are lower, take less from 80% of Alaska families. If we don't talk about alternative revenue measures, uh, it's just going to be more and more PFD cuts. I mean, you're just going to be, the, the PFD defenders are going to be sitting there, you know, in front of the Mack truck, you know, trying to stop the Mack truck and just, just keep on sliding back and back as the Mack truck keeps pushing forward as the spending Mack truck right. keeps pushing forward. If well, you don't talk about alternative measures, it's just going to, it's just going to be the same thing over and over and over more and more PFD cuts. But the bottom line is that it's always more and more, Brad, even if we have new measures, I mean, again, this is my argument. Even if we have new measures, they just all, you know, it's government expands to fill up and consume all available resources. This is what we're talking about. I mean, that, this is the thing that nobody's talking about in any of the things that you just laid out. And you're right. They're like, oh, we're going to increase, you know, we want more child care spending. We want more health care spending. We want more education spending. We want all this spend. And it's exactly what uh, what Ben was talking about in his piece. The PFD will be consumed. The PFD will be completely consumed in the next two budget cycles. And then they'll look around like, Oh, well, you Alaskans have got to pay their fair share anyway. So there's going to be more taxes on top of it. I mean, it's 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 almost an inevitability. It's more and more and more, Michael. But at least if we use alternative revenue measures, at least if we use taxes, it's it's at least fairer to middle and lower income Alaska families, better for the overall Alaska economy than continuing to do it through PFD cuts. Yeah, it doesn't. It 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 it, it may not slow the growth of spending, I believe it will slow the, the rate of growth by getting the top 20% engaged and pushing back on spending. Um, but at least it will be fair. At least non-residents will pay something. Right now they're paying nothing. Seven to 11, seven to 10 percent of Alaska of Alaska spending could be borne by non-residents. Zero is being borne right now. At least the top 20% yeah. will pay a fair share. I can and see. The, yeah, I can see the logic behind that. I definitely can see the logic behind that. Let me play devil's advocate for a minute because I see this probably at least once a week when we talk about this. What about the taxation in places like uh, California and New York and places like that where the taxation is already there? It's broad. It's heavy. Are those people more engaged? Are you know are they more engaged than what we have here? Now it's a little bit of an apples and oranges comparison because they draw the majority of their revenue for their government from taxation. We get it mostly from the oil and the revenues and the and the investments. But I mean, how do you are how do you answer that argument of uh, you know are, these people aren't engaged? How would we become more engaged in that regard? Are you are you going to seriously sit there and tell me that Natasha von Imhoff? Bert Stedman, Gary Stevens, Click Bishop wouldn't become more engaged in spending levels if they had to pay 4% of their income. If Natasha von Imhoff had to pay $100,000 in, in, in taxes, are you seriously sitting there and telling me she wouldn't be more engaged in pushing back on, on spending? It's relative. I mean, yes, California may not be the most uh, 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 thrifty uh, state to live in, but we're talking about Alaska and we're talking about the impact on Alaska's top 20%. We're not talking about trying to impact California's top 20%. If somebody is seriously sitting there and saying, saying Natasha von Imhoff wouldn't look more critically at spending, that Gary Stevens, Bert Stedman, Click Bishop wouldn't look more critically at spending if they had to pay a proportionate share of their income for, for, the, for the cost of government, then I just, I, I, we're not dealing in reality. Right. Those people are going to become more engaged. Uh, uh, the, the people who write the editorials, the people who own the companies, the people who, you know, the, the, the Jim Lang, Langdon's, the, the, those people are going to push back on, on spending more if they have to pay a proportionate share of it. Let's move on to number three. We got about four and a half minutes here. Number three is the next big thing question mark. Is it a big thing? Is it something real? Is it what what's going on here? 
You're talking about new development by Hillcorp. So there's 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 a holy grail in the Alaska oil field, and the only holy grail has always been Agnew. Uh, it's it's the it's it's a formation that stretches across a broad a broad share of the of the North Slope. Um, it's like it it's it's the 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 consistency of it uh, is like molasses. It's very thick. Uh, it lies near the surface, so it's very cold. But there's a lot of oil. There's a lot of it. Uh, there is as much in the Ugnu formation, uh, 23 billion barrels of oil, as there is in Prudhoe, the original Prudhoe field. It's about the size of the original Prudhoe field. But try as they might, um, uh, Alaska, the, the oil producers have never been able to tap into it. And the reason is it's so thick. The consistency of it is so thick that you can't get it to, to produce. It won't come up the pipe. Um, there's been some discussion over the years of trying to mine it uh, in a way that to some degree uh, uh, the oil sands in northern uh, northern Canada, northern Alberta are mined. There's been other proposals on how to deal with it. But if we, if we could ever tap into Ugnu, it's like we've opened another Prudhoe Bay on the North Slope. Doesn't, we're not talking about a new field. We're not talking about uh, uh, step out development. We're talking about a formation that underlies the existing uh, producing areas and being right. able to produce from that. There's an article in the Frontiersman, um, uh, Tim Bradner, uh, who writes a lot on oil issues, has an article in the Frontiersman talking about some some research that's going on at the at the University of Alaska Fairbanks uh, that uh, that seems to be promising in terms of being able to tap into the Agnew field. Um, it's, it's the, it's, it's the addition of polymers, uh, into the, 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 the substances injected into, uh, the, the molasses type oil to get it to, to be thinner, um, uh, and to flow. Now it needs a lot of things to be able to work, but, but the promise of being, of, of tapping into Agnew is a big deal. If, if we're able to do that, if this research, uh, and this effort, would lead us to tap into, into Ugnu, we're in a whole different category of production uh, than we've been in, uh, that we've been in for the last couple of decades. So it's it's not certain, I mean, we've talked about ways to get into Ugnu before. I remember going back to the time that I first became active in Alaska in the 1990s, there was some theory about how we might get into Ugnu. There's been a lot of different uh, discussions over the years. None have really panned out very well. But it's it's the holy grail. If we can find a way to get into Agnew, get Agnew to produce, uh, then we're going to be uh, th then we're going to have a lot more production going on. So it's an encouraging sign. Uh, it's one that I think uh, people ought to be aware of. It's I think one it's one that people ought to be supportive of, um, and uh, and and hopefully it will uh, it will uh, lend some results. Interestingly enough, even though the primary beneficiary would be Hillcorp, Hillcorp's not not spending a dime on this research. The research being is being funded by the federal government and the state government through the through UAF. So right. we'll we'll see how this works out. But it's a big deal and uh, and one that uh, from an oil standpoint we ought to be uh, if you can crack that open because it's not just Ugnu. A lot of fields have this heavy stuff, right? That they can just move or well, Ugnu the primary field quickly. Well, Ugnu Ugnu is the formation. So I mean, Prudhoe has Ugnu in it. Th think about Ugnu being vertical. And the fields being horizontal, so Prudhoe's a certain geographic area. Ugnu's in that is in that field. I see. Uh, it's heavier in uh, Milne Point, Schrader Bluff, uh, but it's it's across a, a, a significant segment of the North Slope. I mean, that would be a huge thing because there are other places where that heavy, sticky, molasses type crude is available, and if they're able to break that cycle. Uh, like you said, I mean, if it's a whole new Prudhoe Bay style thing, that's a that could be a significant amount of revenue for the state and uh, other things. Yeah, Agnew uh, Agnew uh, is 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 significant on state lands, so it's significant underneath Prudhoe. It's significant underneath Milne and Schrader Bluff, and I'm sure it extends over into Anwar and comes on federal lands. But it's a huge source, huge source on state lands, and it's not you don't have to step out your geographic footprint. Because as I said, think about fields as being as being vertical. Ugnu is horizontal across these fields. So it's not like you don't have to go step out from Prudhoe and go someplace else or step out from Alpine or step out from 
Milne and go someplace else. It's right there. It's underneath. It's in they those. Actually, they have to go through that formation to exactly. get the oil that they're pulling right now. So it's, an, exactly. it's not an underlayment. It's almost an overlayment of what they have right now. They got to punch through it to go through. So now if they could draw that, I mean, many fields could benefit from that if they could be able to use it. Yeah. So we're not, we're not talking about, we're not talking about unlike Willow where we're talking about a step out and we're talking about new geographic areas and we're talking about having to get a bunch of uh, permits to get us into the new geographic areas and to build infrastructure in the new geographic areas and do all, you know, incur the expenses of new geographic areas. This is in the existing field, in, in the existing fairway. It's just a question of being able to find the, the, the mechanism to be able uh, to produce it. And, and if the polymer research that UAF is doing um, uh, bears fruit and, and, and reduces the, the thickness of the, of, the, uh, of the oil in a way that we can produce it, uh, we've got a whole new feel, a whole new layer. There we go. A whole new layer uh, that we can tap in and produce. And it's huge. 23 billion barrels. I mean, just to, just to keep in mind how big that is, it's as big as the original Prudhoe field. You can't produce all the 23 billion barrels. I'm, we, we've, we're producing, we started out with a target of producing 40% of Prudhoe, of the 23, 20 some odd billion barrels in Prudhoe. We're now up to 60 or 70% through the enhanced production techniques that we've developed over time. You would start, if we even got 40 out of UGNU, that's a huge number right. in, terms, in terms of its productivity. So big right. deal. Big potential, um, not not a big step out, uh, uh, but something uh, something important. Well, uh, smarter brains than us are working on it, so hopefully they come up with some kind of idea that will allow us to uh, to develop that. It's amazing how the technologies can change. Um, and like you said, when the target was forty to begin with, and now we're producing sixty to seventy percent of the field that was there, all due to the fact that technologies have changed. Uh, nothing to say things can't change yet again. So, uh, yeah, it's good. exactly right. Exactly right. H huge opportunity for the state. Um, sorry, Harold says, spare us. The heavy oil isn't going anywhere. I know this because he was the same guy that said 40%, I'm sure was going to be developed. And that was it instead of the now 60 or so because technology, he knows, he knows. Um, all right, Brad, final thoughts before I let you go here today. Um, any, again, there's a lot of pushback here. Uh, I don't want taxes any more than anybody else, uh, but we we're, being, we're being taxed right now. So uh, I guess the the question is, do you want to pick your poison or do you just want to be poisoned? Uh, I mean, we're, I guess it's all poison in the, in the long run, one less fatal than the other, but uh, your final thoughts here. Well, I, it, you're exactly right, Michael. We're being taxed now. We're being drained now. The, the other 80% are being drained now. They're being drained in order to subsidize, cross subsidize the top 20%. Top twenty percent love it. Non-residents, oh geez, come to Alaska. Don't have to. Don't have to give up any of your income. God, that's what a great deal. Um, they love it, but the other eighty percent are bearing the burden of it. And and the question is whether whether we want that to continue all the way down to where the to eight, the the other eighty percent give up their PFD to fund government. The top twenty percent don't have to tap into their money, and the and the and non-residents get to keep all of theirs. There's a fairness to tax. There's there's a fairness issue in taxation, and the fairness issue goes all the way back, you know, to the beginning of capitalism. It goes all the way back to Adam Smith's wealth wealth of nations. Adam Smith addressed what a fair tax situation is, and he said all citizens benefiting from government contribute proportionately to the cost of government. They all benefit. They all contribute according to, you know, the the amount of of income they've got, including non residents. That's a fairness issue. Everybody chips in. What we've got in Alaska is, as Matt Berman calls it, Professor at Iser calls it, the most regressive form of taxation ever. And, and we've, we're shifting the burden to, to middle and lower income Alaska families, letting the top 20% non-residents off the hook. I mean, that's, that's the issue. Do you want to continue going down that road where we're taxing the other 80% so the top 80, more tax, essentially a surcharge on the other 80% so the top 20% get off the hook. Is that the road you want to continue going down? There are better ways to do it, fairer ways to do it, fairer right. ways of taxation, and we, ought, and we ought to be doing them. Lisa and Gary, I think, summate what we've been talking about all day today. Realistically, this state will eventually have taxes, income and sales taxes. Uh, I mean, we have taxes right now, but eventually when that money is gone, which 
could be as little as two budget cycles from now, th then it'll be, why don't we pay our fair share kind of thing? That'll be and, the argument. And, and the question is, do we want to give up the PFD? Do the eighty, do the other 80% want to give up the, the, the PFD and then pay taxes on top of it? Right. Or do you want to fairly spread the taxes out now, keep the PFD going, fairly spread out the tax burden now, and, and engage the top 20% in pushing right. back on spending? Because you're, still, Natasha, you're still benefiting, here. yeah, you're still benefiting the economy by the by distributing the PFD. You're engaging and and benefiting the entire economy, even if you had taxes on top of it. The benefit of turning that money six or seven times would still be greater in the long run, even if you did have taxes at the end. All right, Brad, uh, we're out of time. Thank you, my friend, for coming on board and joining us. As always, good to talk with you, Michael. As always, thanks for having me. We appreciate it. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.